supercomputers that are trillions of times more powerful than the average smartphone we have today, going inside of our bodies, our, our bodies and uh, interfacing with our biology. So we're talking about a merger of biology and computation. We're talking about a mastering of the information processes of biology, reverse engineering, aging, curing all of our diseases, having, I mean, all sorts of what Freeman Dyson calls a new future where a new generation of artists will be writing genomes the way that Lake and Byron used to write verses. So when, when biology becomes the canvas for the artist, when we get to play with the canvas of life, the way we currently play with software, the overlapping revolutions in biotech with uh, information technology, with nanotech, which is to manipulate matter at the level of the atom, and then AI, artificial intelligence, all these three revolutions overlapping over on top of each other lead us towards this event horizon sooner than we than we actually think, right? Yeah. In the next 25, 30 years. So he calls it a singularity as a way of saying, look, we're about to cross a threshold and everything is going to change. It's going to change even more than the world changed when we invented language 100,000 years ago. I mean, the world post-language would have been inconceivable to early hominids on the other side of that line. A world of skyscrapers, of jet engines, of agriculture, of progress, of poetry, of rich inner thinking. You know, this world post-language would have been inconceivable free language and so too with the singularity. What comes after those three overlapping revolutions? Impossible to fathom. There's an interesting uh, idea put out there by Andy Clark, he's a cognitive philosopher, that he says we need to get over what he calls our skin bag bias, which is this bias that says that anything that's within our tissue is somehow us and somehow natural, and anything that's beyond our tissue is somehow separate from us. And he says that really we're, that, that he talks about the idea that minds are actually constructed out of the feedback loops between brains, tools, and their environment. And so, you know, he talks about the iPhone or our smartphones as our extended minds. He says if you take the big picture, the long view from outside, we're outsourcing our cognition to these tools already. So they may not be inside of our tissue, but that doesn't take away the fact that they're a part of us, no different than the termite colony is a part of the termite species. They are our phenotypes. And so we may have a, if we drew the Vitruvian man today, and we pointed little diagram arrows at him, and we say, oh, this is his frontal lobe, this is his opposable thumb, he'd be holding a smartphone, and we would point to it, and we say, this is his extended mind. It, it, it's almost like the whole thing is nature. It's all part of the same continuum. It's all made of atoms and it's all unfolding. And we are of nature, so anything that we create, including technology and smartphones, is a part of us. And so by engaging in feedback loops with these tools, it's almost as if thus far evolution has decided that it took less effort to extend our cognitive faculty through the use of this device than it would have to grow an extra frontal lobe to give us like additional mental resources. So it's almost like like we're figuring out ways of doing it smarter. Like it was almost, e it's easier to create an iPhone and store 10,000 emails on it than it would be to grow an extra frontal lobe. Although inevitably, eventually, we will master the information processes of biology and be able to upgrade our biological hardware with the same ease with which, which we engineer these magical devices today. That's, I think, is inevitable. And part of the ongoing human technology co-evolution, symbiotic relationship. Man has always assimilated his environment and made it a part of who he is. These boats, that opera house, these skyscrapers and towers, these are our extended phenotypes. It's who we are. And when we look at human beings, we shouldn't just look at the naked hominids. We should look at all of these things. And we should point at these things as distinct features of the Homo sapiens ecosystem. Creatures of my